Are we rolling? Check good? All right, guys. Uh, welcome to day one, if you will. Um, I see here on my schedule that, uh, let's see, we are scheduled for this from 2. Apparently, the next thing is 6 p.m. So, unlike Zoom calls where Canuck gets mad if I go past 20 minutes, he gave me four hours. Uh, yeah, exactly. Question questionable. <laughs> questionable, all right? All right. Yeah. All right. Um, Yeah. Okay. Uh, quick show of hands. Uh, who was here last year and heard me speak on this concept of relationships? Okay. So a fair amount. Uh, additionally to that, again, if, if either that or who was on the Zoom call where we talked about relationship. So either one of those. Again, we're looking at still only about half, maybe a little slightly more than half. Okay. So I'm going to... so. Let me give you a little bit of introduction to this personality that some of you know as Kosher Dad, um, for those because there, well, there's new people here as well, um, and and how these things. How about this? Is anybody is there anybody in the room who has not been until this anyway uh, has not previously been introduced to a PDF that at the bottom says compiled by Kosher Dad? Has anybody not seen one of these before? Okay, so, so now we got a much higher percentage of people who've seen one of these. Okay, so let me explain what these things are. Um, so it, uh, it really started as my children. So I have seven children. My wife and I have seven children together. And, the, uh, and um, my two oldest children went through the transition with us, right, of, of you know, singing happy birthday to Jesus at Christmas and stuff like that to, to you know what, uh, Christmas is actually about presents. There's no two ways about it. We need to make a change. Um, and the, uh, so they, they went through that, that change. And, and also, um, we went from, so we think we should be doing something different. How? What do you, how do you do that? So if you, if you decide you want to do the Passover, how do you keep the Passover? If you decide you want to do these feasts that are in there, how, how does one even do that? And so, you, you know, many of you probably went and grabbed you know, Passover for Christians book or something like that, right? And, and tried to do that. And well, that didn't seem right. So, so my two oldest children experienced a life where every year we were doing something different as we were trying to crack the code on what the heck we were supposed to do. Um, and, and that left some marks, right? And so one of the things that my wife and I realized is, you know, Shema, we're supposed to teach them diligently to our children. And I felt, I, it hit me uh, a few years ago that ultimately, and I think I mentioned on a Zoom call, I, I, know, uh, I know Storms was on it, I, I, some of the other people that have been there long term heard me say that I didn't feel like I had adequately lived up to my responsibility to teach this diligently to my children. And the part of that is because you can't teach them something you don't know, right? So you, there's this process we're all at some point you know, you're here, so you must be somewhere along the line on the process. So, one of the, the, one, the first thing, the first compiled, it wasn't compiled by Kosher Dad back then, it was just Dad trying to explain to my children by far more in depth than the experience of us continuing to do all this weird stuff, um, why it is that we do the thing, we're doing the things that we do for the Passover. And, for, and I did it, so I did it for each of the feasts, trying to explain to my children, making sure that even if my older children um, were frustrated by having lived through that, my younger children who've never experienced a Christmas um, would understand because they're, they're, gonna get, they're gonna get exposed to the world. And so we're different. And so why are we different? I want my children to be on a rock solid foundation they might choose differently later on in their lives, but I don't want there to be any doubt in their minds why it is we're making the choices that we're making. And so it was out of that obligation to my children that I started compiling scriptures on a specific subject. The overall concept that I'm running with here is that if you want to understand what God has to say about something, you ought to compile everything that he had to say on the subject and then that's how you get the full picture you shouldn't go to a teaching on youtube although i fully understand many of us are here because you saw a teaching on youtube and that's i'm not so i'm not saying that but i'm saying at some point he told you he wanted to be your teacher 
And so, hence why so many of us are attracted to this concept of read the book and do what it says, because that's what the book tells us to do. So it's, so all that's great. And so, but that is kind of the, how this started. It was on my heart to explain to my children why we were doing the things we were doing in order to keep the peace. In the process of doing that, other subjects started hitting me uh, of, of, of things that I needed to better understand. Like, um, just, I don't know, just subject after subject. You guys have seen a bunch of these. So the, the, there's just other subjects would hit me as, I don't fully understand this. Um, I'm seeing a couple connections. It's time to get the big picture. And so what my process is, um, some of us were talking about the Sabbath last night. So I jump onto Blue Letter Bible and I do a word search for the word Sabbath. And then I go ahead and I capture all of those verses and I capture the verses around them to try to get the context of where each of those verses are. And then after I get done, because I've read enough, I realize I, did, I know there's other verses about the Sabbath that I didn't get in that, in that. And then, so then all of a sudden I think about it for a second. Oh, sometimes it says Sabbaths plural. And so I do another word search for Sabbaths. I do then somewhere in there I see sometimes where it's kind of referring to it additionally as like the seventh day. So then I do a word search for the seventh day and see if that captures anything else that's talking about the Sabbath. And so I keep following that thread. I keep pulling on that thread until it seems like I might be at the 90 plus percent solution of capturing it all. So like if you've seen my PDF, PDF on one of these things like the Passover, I'm probably missing some verses, but uh, I would submit that you can probably get his intent by reading that stuff because it's the vast majority for sure. Okay. And so that's how these, that's how these things. And so as, as, as something gets put on my heart, um, then that's how, that's how I dig in. That's how I accelerate the process because reading from cover to cover is great. And I recommend that everybody do that. Um, I recommend that you have a regular reading schedule. Um, but as you know, various topics are shotgun blasts through the entirety. Like you, you're going to find verses on the Sabbath throughout the entire book. Right. And so, so by the time it, you start to forget the one, by the time you're, if you're, if you're going to do cover to cover, it, you know, by the time you get to revelation, it's been a long time since you were reading the Torah. Right. And so it's hard. It's hard for me, at least um, a slightly below average Marine or whatever that that I can uh, that I can do that. And the um, and so what I do is I dump all these things into a word processing document and then I read them directly um, and then they start to form into groups. Oh, so this is this is talking about this one part. And so these all go together and then these all go together and, and so on and so forth. And by the time I reorganize it all into stuff that makes sense to my brain, I feel like I got a pretty good idea about what he wants us to do on the Sabbath, as an example. So that's the that's the process. And when I start once I started doing that process, um, it seemed like I was jamming my foot on the accelerator pedal of of getting to know the will of God, getting to know the word of God way faster um, than I was doing when I was reading cover to cover. Um, so, but I still incorporate. So I actually, I actually caught a, um, I caught a, one of uh, PJ's videos one time and he happened to be, he was talking about the Passover, which caught my attention because I was interested on in what his take on the Passover was. And it's funny because the, my, the thing that's, that hit me on that video that he just mentioned, I think he was talking about the Passover. So this was sort of just in passing. I had just finished uh, another whole read of the Bible where I got done with the Torah. Then I went back and reread the, the New Testament. I was just going to read the Gospels, but then I thought, oh, there's not much left. I might as well finish the New Testament. And then I got interested in something with prophets. So I went through, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm actually not that far from rereading the whole thing again. So I, I finished everything. And then, so now I was deciding, I was thinking about what I was going to, where I was going to go to read next. And he made this side comment on that video about how um, the foundation, which I 100% agree with, the foundation is the Torah. And so all, most of us have a weak foundation because we were, we were, in churches or, or in groups of people that uh, aren't paying too much attention to the first five books. And they're you know, going to the back of the book and trying to come up with all their conclusions there. But you can't make proper conclusions if you only read the back because the foundation of the building is the first five books. And so we need to keep working on building up that foundation because for the vast majority of us, that foundation is pretty weak. And so he made the comment that you really ought to read the Torah every day. 
And I was like, that's a great idea. And so I started reading one chapter. I start at Genesis 1, and I read one chapter every day. If I get distracted and I fall behind, I do play catch up. Um, and, uh, and what I quickly discovered is that's twice through the Torah per year with a little bit of change at the end, but, but more or less you're reading the Torah twice per year. And again, I felt like my foot was getting on the accelerator pedal and I was starting to make connections faster than I was before because I was still doing other research and other reading within the, within the book, but I always made sure I read a chapter of Torah a day. And I thought, I to this day think that is bedrock solid advice. And so if you're not doing that, I highly recommend you incorporate that into whatever your daily study is. But anyway, so it kept happening, right? So all of a sudden I'd get an impression, you know, I need to do this. And, and Canuck was on the receiving end of this because back when the Zoom calls were a little more free-floating, uh, he'd all of a sudden go, it sounds like we're getting another series. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, I think we are actually. Um, and, and so it kept going. And some of you have seen some, like I think the, I think the Sabbath one is 44 pages long. Um, so some of these end up being a lot. And, and so anyway, so then... Then we start getting towards COVID on the scene, right? And, and, the, um, and, and so, I'm trying to think what to say about this, that it became obvious to my wife and I really quickly that they were gonna use, they were gonna use our morals against us, right? And in fact, in Utah, they put out a, a joint statement of faith um, that paraphrasing said that you're intentionally harming your neighbor if you won't wear the mask and social distance. This is before the jab. And if you're intentionally harming your neighbor, you don't love your neighbor, okay? And, the, and so they were, they were saying that you were in violation of the second great commandment. And I, was, and I immediately recognized that's gonna, be, that's gonna be it. That's what they're coming after us with. And in fact, you may remember last year, I played the sound clip for you guys of, uh, regardless what you think of the individual that's in the position, the position was the vice president of the United States of America making that exact argument that if you don't get the vaccine, you don't love your neighbor. Um, and so what became immediately obvious to me was if that's what they're gonna attack people like us with, I better have a rock solid understanding of what God meant when he said that you shall love your neighbor as yourself so that when my actual physical neighbors come at me like they were um, about why won't you do this, I will have a rock solid answer biblically. And so I sat down at my, uh, at my desk in my, in my previous house uh, that many of you have seen the bookshelf behind it on and I sat down to dig in and start doing a compiled by Kosher Dad on the second great commandment. And I looked up the first verse and got, it was one of these occasions in my life where I got a physical tap on the shoulder. And it, these, it, it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens on occasion. And I was like, something's up. I'm missing something. And what the obvious thing that all of a sudden hit me like a ton of bricks is, how about you study the first one before the second one? And I was like, yeah, I, you know, the first great commandment, you probably, in order to understand the second great commandment, obviously you must have to build the foundation of what the first great commandment was. So that turned into, you know, that the first great commandment one is probably 20 to 30 pages. The second great commandment one is even longer. Um, and, and then a couple other things from that. And, and one of the things that hit me about a year and a half ago is as I'm doing these, com these compiling these scriptures, there were some scriptures that kept coming up over and over and over, regardless of the topic I was digging into. And so all of a sudden, it started connecting all of these things, okay? And so what you have for those, does anybody need a copy of this, by the way? Does everybody have a copy? The, so what, how, what this is, is I've got probably 100 to 200 pages of the compiled by Kosher Dad, and this is, you know, the cherry picking thing? This is, these are the cherry picked verses, okay? Um, and what I, can, what I can tell you, I can't promise you that I'm right, but what I can promise you is this is me saying that this is in the context of the 200 pages. So this is, this, the, these are the highlights that get you the conclusion of the 200 pages. And the 200 pages is completely consistent with what I'm about to present to you. Okay. So I absolutely encourage you, if this motivates you, to dig in the same way, that I, you know, same way or similar that I do and prove me wrong. Right. So for yourself. Right. And look to prove me wrong. And in the process, prove yourself wh what you need to do. OK. So this, the subject is the relationships. OK. And the 
And I would make the argument that this, this is, you know, how many, how many people get up in front of you? And what I'm about to tell you is like the most important thing. Well, gentlemen, what I'm about to tell you is the most important thing, okay? Let's see. So, got a little bit ahead of myself. We are at Arm the Saints, by the way. Obviously, on our, all of our shirts, it says Exodus 15.3. Anybody know what Exodus 15.3 is? Yeah, so he's a, war, he, he's a man of war, right, depending on, on translation there. So on the, the first year when we got together, um, I got tasked, I and Larry, Larry got tasked, Larry and I got tasked with uh, um, the sword and the shield. Um, and so uh, I think Larry took the shield, I ended up with the sword, and, uh, and so we started digging in. I did the same thing with the word search and all that kind of stuff, that's why we came up with that. Um, and so Exodus 15.3, but to me, what really puts together what we're doing here is Ephesians 6. So the top one, Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, but being, being watchful to this end all, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so what is truth? Well, truth is the word of God. And so we ought to be studying it like our life depends on it. Why? Because it does. Um, it really, really, truly does. And we know that as much as we feel persecuted today, this is only the scratch on the surface of what is foretold is coming, right? And so is it coming tomorrow? Is it coming in our lifetimes? I don't know, but we should be preparing. Um, as, as Bear rightly says, to exercise our no muscle. And several of you have heard me say this, what's the big one that matters when it comes to, if you won't comply with this, I'm not gonna allow you to buy and sell, that's the one that's gonna matter more than all the rest. And so we need to be in a position of strength to say, no, I won't comply. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. So I believe to my core, that is the heart of what this Arming the Saints is all about, is that sh sword and that shield, um, and really more the shield than the sword is what I think the conclusion I came to four years ago. So it gets to the relationship. So why do I say this concept of the relationship is the most important thing? Number one, because everything I study points to this. Number two, when Christ was asked what's the most important thing, this was his response. So I think he gives the most complete answer in the book of Mark in chapter 12, because when he's asked what is the first commandment of all, he quotes the first two lines of the Shema. Okay, And so the Shema uh, in the New King James is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand and as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay, so there's a lot there. That's a lot of meaty stuff, okay? And it, and it went right to my heart because about the teaching diligently to your children. It talks about the heart condition of it being on your heart. It talks about how these topics of religion should not be taboo. It should be the thing we talk about the most, continuously even. It talks about the fact that it needs to be a sign on our hand as frontless between our eyes. Well, the mark of the beast is the, is the, is the counterfeit of that, right? So through, through our actions and through our thoughts, which come out as our, as our voice, um, this should be obvious that we are on his team working to align our lives with his word and his will. And then putting it on the doorposts of your house, on your gates, to me, that ties us directly into the Passover um, because that's what we do at the Passover with the blood. Um, and, and so on and so forth. And so it starts weaving into all this stuff. But the key phrase that I did, ended up doing the word search on is this idea that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And so I searched all heart and all soul because I knew that phrase comes up a bunch, but I, didn't, I wasn't really prepared for how often that phrase comes up. So obviously, and oh, by the way, in the, in the, the Hebrew Gospels of, of Mark, um, 
The, the oldest ones that the, the, the group that I've been uh, uh, lucky enough to be slightly associated with, um, they were able to, to, to look it up. And it, so in, the, in whatever you are looking at, whether it's the scriptures or the King James or New King James or whatever, the words are close, but it's not an exact match. In the Hebrew, it's an exact match. He's quoting, period, dot, end of story. He's pointing us directly to the Shema. But I would also make the argument that he's pointing everywhere else. It's talking about loving God with our whole heart and our whole, our, all our heart and all our soul. Okay, and that, open, that starts to open up the aperture even farther of these different places within Scripture that he's talking. Okay, as an example, Deuteronomy, or that's the Shema, the... Uh, we get, um, well, we get a whole bunch of different places that I apparently forgot I didn't, I, I put them in here. So then, so then you have to go, okay, so now we take a look at what the world is defining love, okay? So you ask, grab Joe Snuff, Snuffy off the street and ask him what they think love is, you're going to hear a lot about tingly feelings, right? You might hear uh, some physical relationship between men and women or, well, let's just leave it at that for now. You might hear a lot of other things you didn't want to hear about that, but physical relationships, right? Um, but the, again, it gets back to that tingly feeling stuff, right? Um, what gets you sexually aroused and, and, and all that stuff. And, but it's, it's, it's been synthesized down to this concept of feelings. And as many of you would know, if you go into any mainstream Christian church and listen to a, a sermon uh, that touches on the concept of love, you're going to hear a whole bunch more about feelings, okay? Well, lucky for us... Again, we should define words how God defines them. Lucky for us, he blatantly defined this a couple of times. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, For this is the love of God. So you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Okay? So what is that? And it's not going to be a surprise to anybody in this room. The answer is that we keep his commandments. And then, oh, by the way, that his commandments are not burdensome. It's not supposed to be hard. We get even more direct in 2 John chapter 1, verse 6. This is love. I mean, that's how, how more clear could we be that this is his definition of love? Again, not a surprise that we walk according to his commandments. This commandment that you have heard from the beginning, first five books, you should walk in it, okay? So that's where we define, so what is love? Is it a feeling? No, it's an action. That action is to keep his commandments. Okay, that seems pretty darn straightforward. Then... We get some warnings, and so an example of these warnings that we get is in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Now, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We're getting an if statement again. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Okay? So, what this, so this starts to hit me now. Wait a minute. So it's telling me that if I'm not trying to keep the commandments... I don't know God. How do you get to know somebody? You get to know somebody through a relationship with them. Okay, when you first introduce them, you don't know much about them. As you get, it takes a relationship. It takes communication in order to form that relationship and to get to know somebody, let alone God. And in this particular case, it's telling us that if we don't go put this effort forth to try to keep the commandments, we are lying to ourselves if we say that we know God. Additionally, you've got the other side of that equation. That's the equation of how we get to know Him. And Christians will quickly point out, oh, He knows every hair on your head, right? So He, he knows everybody. Okay, if, great, but in Matthew 7, 21, 23, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Wait a minute, I thought he knew every, head on, every hair on my head. And yet here he is rebuking them and saying, I don't know you. Who are the people that he doesn't know? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who are not trying to keep my commandments. So I didn't get to know him because I wasn't trying to keep his commandments. He told me that's how I would get to know him. And if I didn't do that, I was kidding myself. And conversely, if I don't enter into that relationship with me, him, he's saying he doesn't know me. He doesn't know my heart. I would argue that maybe he does know my heart. It's just that my heart has pointed to, away from him. Okay? We see the same thing in Matthew 25. This is the story of the ten virgins. 
And so in the story of the Ten Virgins, five of them don't do as they're told. I would make the argument that the, what they, what, it wasn't about the oil, it was about the lamp. And in the Proverbs, we define lamp as the commandments. So they were told to keep the commandments. They failed to do so. As many of you are learning, you can't just come up to Bear or me or PJ and say, teach me everything right now because I've, I, no, you learn by doing. You learn through the process of trial and error. And you can't, you can't get that for free. You can only get it through doing the work. And so read the book and do what it says. The doing is super important. Um, off the top of my head, James chapter one at the end talks about that, of don't be a hearer only, but be a doer. That's an extremely important concept that we get there in James. But here we have the same thing. When, the, when five of the virgins come back, they knock on the door and he's there. And again, his answer is, I do not know you. Okay, and again, because of the Proverbs, we know he's talking about they didn't keep the commandments. The commandment is a lamp, is what it says in, the Pro in Proverbs uh, chapter 6, verse 20, whatever it is. Um, and so, so it's, again, it's a direct correlation that we start to get this relationship defined, okay? That we get to know each other through our process of trying to keep the commandments. Now, um, which, what, so which are the commandments we're talking about? Okay, and I would argue we see again in Deuteronomy 30, we're going to get the with all your heart and with all your soul piece. Okay, so I would argue that Christ is pointing us directly to this section. And in here, starting in verse 9, it says, The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the in increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. And, and as some of us have been talking about uh, just in the short time we've been here, I think he's telling us that he wants to bless us in food production. Well, if they won't let you go buy food, if you won't comply, this puts you in that position of strength to exercise your no muscle and say, no, I don't need it, okay? He's telling us he wants to bless us in that. We should take him up on his offer. But continuing on, for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. And then we get the if then. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes and then just in case there was any doubt as to where we were supposed to go to find out what they were, it says blatantly, which are written in this book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul. Um, so now we see in, in this, we see elements of Ezekiel 18. And, and we clearly define, because we're in the book of Deuteronomy, that at, when that's written, this book of the law is the Torah. It, it's the only thing it can be when we're sitting here reading this in Deuteronomy 30. So that is where we go to find the instruction manual. We go to the Torah. Everything else is talking about how to do or not do that and giving us examples. So that's it. So we're supposed to keep the commandments in order to enter into this relationship. Um, it's how we get to know him, how he gets to know us. Uh, which commandments are we talking about? We're talking about the Torah. And it's all pretty darn blatant. And these are not the only verses that point us there. These are just the ones that do it the most in your face. Okay? Um, any questions on that? Okay. Now, has any... Sir? You sure you didn't read ahead? Oh, All yeah. right. We're heading in that direction, my friend. <laughs> yep. Uh, we're, we're heading there. We're going to get there. Hang on. Uh, okay. So has, did, has anybody... So, so you know, you've got, you've got Masonic, you've got Hebrew roots, you've got all these different terms that, as we've, some of us talked about in the, in the last day or so, can get messy fast as, as, a, as far as associating ourselves with labels, right? Um, so the most non labely label that, that, that I've been able to come up with is everybody here at some point in their life became what I refer to as Torah aware. So you became aware of the fact that the Torah says that you're supposed to do this forever throughout your generations and so on and so forth. So you became aware of that. Um, and then anybody in this room in the very beginning of your awareness on the fact that you might need to pay more attention to that, did anybody experience a sense of overwhelm 
of, man, there's an awful lot I have no idea about, I've been deceived about, I, I don't get it. Where on earth do I start? Is that not a common experience for all of us? Is anybody that did not at some level have that experience of I'm being told there's 600 and some odd number of laws that I need to do perfectly um, or else I'm a failure and where do I even start and, and how on earth am I going to cram all this into my brain and where do I go, right? So huge sense of overwhelm. All right, well, consider this. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 5, it says, You should know in your heart that as a man chastens, some other words that you could use for chastens there, instructs, corrects, rebukes, those would all be synonyms for what we're getting at with chastens. You should know that in your heart that as a man chastens his son, father-son relationship, the Lord, your God, chastens you. Okay, so instructs, corrects, rebukes you. Okay? Go to Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Okay? Even though we're going to get, uh, I don't think I put it here, but there's other, yeah, no, it's the next one. Okay, so I'll get to it in just a second. Uh, of the Lord, nor detest his correction. Let's pause on 11 right there and go forward to Hebrews uh, 12, 11. Now, no chasten, it, this isn't a fun process. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, okay? So this, this instruction is not necessarily pleasant because you're being told you failed. Anybody here like being told by somebody else that they failed? Right? Well, okay, you're trying to explore some wisdom there of understanding that after you've been told, you actually learn more from the failures. Am I on the right track? All right, so, so there's a little wisdom there in the room, okay? Yes, but as a general rule, we as men, you know, have some level of ego and we don't like to be wrong. And so when we get called out, especially by somebody who we care about, um, that's not necessarily, generally speaking, a pleasant experience. And it shouldn't surprise us because we are told to expect that in Hebrews 12, 11. Okay, back to the Proverbs, verse 12. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. This is a huge piece of the puzzle, okay? Because until this, we've only been talking about how we demonstrate to God that we love him. But in a relationship, we need to know if he loves us. So, how does he communicate his love to us? I see nowhere else in Scripture... You know, people will talk about blessings and so on and so forth. No, that, those are consequences for good choices. The place where it tells us how he loves us, and there's a few different examples of this, is he's telling us he loves us because he chastens, corrects, rebukes us. Okay? So, if you think about that, if you extrapolate that out for a second, instead of bragging about, I was blessed with this and I was blessed with that, we really ought to be bragging about all our chastenings. Because that's God pouring his love onto us by definition. The blessings are a consequence of making good decisions in accordance with his word and his will. But if you want to talk about how you know he loves you, he loves you if he's corrected you. And so I would submit that the, the, the Christian person that, you know, searched this stuff out when they were a teenager, but now, and they have not made a single change since then. They think they've got it down. They, they said the prayer and that's it. And they're not getting any correction whatsoever. Well, this also goes to that concept of bantering that some of us have been talking about. And I've been mention mentioning the fact that you don't banter with somebody that you don't respect, you don't like. Okay? He's telling us here that if you're not receiving chastening, if you're not receiving rebuke, if you're not receiving correction, that's because he's given up on you. Why did he give up on you? You probably told him you didn't want to be in the relationship anymore. Okay? And how do you tell him you don't want to be in the relationship anymore? You don't accept the correction and keep the commandments. Okay, so you, you, you stepped into the relationship. Yeah, I'd like to try to keeping the commandments. Keeping the commandments sucks. Now I'm an outsider. Screw that. I don't want to do that anymore. You've just basically ended the relationship. And he will honor that and he will stop correcting you. It's really that simple. So now what do we have going on? Now we've got two-way communication. I'm communicating that I want to be in this relationship. And if there's such a thing as unconditional love, I would say this is what it's re represented by, is this relationship is available to us unconditionally. If we will take him up on his offer, he will accept us into the relationship. 
um, then it's our job to stay in the relationship, but we still have free will and we might choose at a later day to leave the relationship. But whether or not you are still in the relationship would be defined here. If he's not correcting you anymore, it's not because you're perfect. <laughs> not possible, right? Also, consider this. Where do we get this from? We get this from the Proverbs, okay? Which the implication of that is there was never an expectation of perfection on our part. This isn't a new revelation through Christ, through Yeshua. This was always the deal. If he was expecting perfection, he would have communicated to us that he loves us based on perfection. He didn't do that. He's demonstrating his love to us, of us, to us, by correcting our mistakes. And so because he chose that as his means of communication, I can only jump to the logical conclusion that he was expecting me to make mistakes. That's built into the plan from day one, okay? So that was, you tell me he didn't know Adam and Eve were going to head down the choices that they did? He, he had to have. He's, he knows everything, right? So this was baked into the pie from jump, okay? That we were never expected. So when you hear people telling you, quoting you the verses and telling you, if you fail at just one, you failed at them all, don't even try, that's, that's the total wrong answer. The expectation is failure, and then we need to find a way to accept the correction, okay? So, so that is huge to me of, yeah, that's all a lie, this whole thing that, that, that it, you have to do it. So, so now I've started to change. Because of this, I, started, I try to change my vernacular of how I describe what I'm doing. I don't say, I keep the commandments. I say, I'm trying to keep the commandments acknowledging that I am coming up short, um, but heart condition matters. Me demonstrating that I want to be in the relationship matters. That's the part that matters. And then me listening for the corrections. So how can those corrections come? Those corrections can come by studying the Bible, whether, regardless of which version you choose. Those corrections can come through prayer and paying attention to the promptings, um, which may lead you to a place in the Bible. Um, those corrections can come through what we're doing right now in fellowship with each other through, the conf through what I refer to as good conversations where you're actually getting somebody else's perspective to see something in a new way, in a new light you didn't have the capability to see on your own because of your life experience. Um, and so I believe to my core, we, we have to have the fellowship. We have to get to a place where we can have these conversations without pissing each other off and going, all right, well, because you're a conjuncture moon guy and I'm a sliver guy, we can't be friends anymore. It's like, wait a minute, you're both trying to keep the Passover. <laughs> really? We're talking about a difference of maybe 24 to 48 hours here. But the, the bigger picture is we both want to keep the Passover. Um, how are we letting that be the wedge that drives between us, and now we can't have a relationship? That's crazy to me, okay? So that's a big thing. He didn't, ex he didn't, he didn't expect perfection ever. It wasn't, it wasn't the expectation. So then... How do, we, how do we start to learn this? Well, it says in the Proverbs, for the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. In other words, wisdom, knowledge and understanding, all emanate from the mouth of the Lord. What comes out of the mouth of the Lord? His words, which we get not only through prayer and through our, our actual no kidding conversations with him, if you will, but certainly through the written word of God that we have access to. That's his word. That's the foundation of it all. That is where all truth all wisdom, all knowledge emanates from these words written in this book. So we should be studying them, okay? And we should be studying them diligently every single day, all right? Um, so then, again in the Proverbs, and by the way, that theme is throughout the Proverbs, of course, um, but then in Proverbs 11:2 we have, when pride comes, then comes shame, and then the reason I'm bringing up this thing about wisdom is, but with the humble is wisdom. What we just equated to wisdom is the word of God, okay? Wisdom is the word of God. And so in order to understand the word of God, clearly we see here it's not optional. It's a requirement that we have humility. Why? Well, what happens when we have pride? What does that look like in this relationship we're talking about? 
So I decide I'm interested in getting into this relationship. So I try to keep a commandment. Maybe that's the Sabbath, maybe that's the Passover, whatever. Float to your boat, the first, first try, right, at something. And then uh, there's a high likelihood that I get that wrong. Even if I get it right, if we're in a relationship, it's either going to be nice try, try again, like this. That's really an explanation, that's a correction, that's a rebuke, that's instruction on how he wants you to do it in accordance with his word and his will that you didn't get out of however you came across it in the first place. Or the other obvious possibility there is good job. Now will you do this one? Right? Now, if we let pride creep into this, what do you mean do this one now? Is that not enough? I freaking st I stepped out and I, I did this. Now, if that's not good enough, I have to do this also? You just, asked, you just invited yourself out of the relationship because of your prideful heart. You would not accept the chastening. You would not accept the instruction. You would not accept that commandment. You wouldn't do it, and you just exited the relationship. So he gives you your choice. Or he says, okay, no more correction comes. Whereas, if we can have the humility of a child who acknowledges they don't know anything and accept the correction and then act on it, we're right back to the keep the commandment part. And then we're going to get either a rebuke or a good job and then the next one. And now we are in a full-blown cycle of communication, which is a, re a real relationship. And there you go on your answer on do I suddenly need to you know, matrix download 600 and some odd commands. No, I just need to do one to the best of my ability, have enough humility in my heart to accept the correction if I get it wrong and try again. Eventually, I'm hoping for the good job and then the next one. And so how that physically manifests itself for me in my study is I'll read stuff in the scripture that I, I don't understand and I will just gloss over it. And I'm looking for the one that I do understand because that's the next one he's trying to instruct me on. Why else did it suddenly become so clear to me when last time I read it, it didn't make any sense to me? It has to be the next thing he wants me to do. If I read something and it makes sense to me, but I don't incorporate it into my life, well, I was just given a command. I was shown clearly what he wanted me to do, and I chose not to. I just exited the relationship. And so it's this constant cycle of communication and being humble enough to accept the next one that jumps off the page or you get a huge prompting or whatever it is, you need to have the humility to do it and that keeps us churning this thing. And in the process, we get to know him better, we get to know his word, his will for our lives in accordance with his word and his will, and he gets to know our heart. And there we, there's the relationship. There's how we don't get to the end and get the, I don't know you, or me saying, I think I know you. And he's like, you don't know me. You haven't been keeping my commandments. You, you don't know. And that is our relationship with the Father. In those few verses, backed up by hundreds of others, that is the model of the true. I mean, how, in Christianity, they're all talking about our relationship with Christ, right? But their relationship with Christ is they said the prayer. End of story. Right? That's not a relationship. You know, how do you know God loves you? Oh, I feel so warm inside. I'll try, it'll all turn into the fuzzy feelings. Uh, how, do, how do you know that he loves you? Oh, I just feel so good. Yeah, that, can you put, can you, no, that's it. It's just empty feelings, okay? Love is an action, and that is the definition of what he says is the most important thing. Is this our relationship with God? It starts there. Because he said that was the most important thing, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. See if I covered all the ones I wanted to cover there. Humility, pride. All right, so just to get uh, the hammer home on that, Proverbs 13, 18. Poverty and shame will come to whom disdains correction. Why? Because he's going to stop receiving correction and instruction, and then bad things will happen. But he who regards a rebuke will be honored. Honored with what? A relationship. Another instruction. You know, you get elevated, lifted up with more. Uh, Proverbs 12.1, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates a correction is stupid. Is that, if that's not as blatant as it gets, I don't know what is. Uh, that's just a slap you around one, right? You're a freaking idiot. Uh, Proverbs 10.17, 
He who keeps instruction is in the way of life. So when we talk about the path we're on, if you're continuing in the relationship, you are in the way of life. But he who refuses correction goes astray, gets off the path, ends the relationship. Couldn't be any more clear as far as I can, as far as I can see. Um, and finally, uh, Hebrews 12, 5, 12, 5 through 8. And you, have uh, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. It's a restating of the proverb. And scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure the chastening, God deals with you as sons. What better relationship than the father-son deal? And uh, for, what the son, for what son is there whom the father does not chasten? But, and here's where I got blatantly this idea, if you're not being corrected or chastened, you're not in the relationship. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You're not in the relationship. So if you're not being corrected, you need to check check yourself and ask if you're even in a relationship with him because he only gives the corrections to the people he's in the relationship with as defined by these verses. Any questions on the highlights there of the model of what our relationship with the Father is supposed to look like? Go. So, um, when you're in a relationship with the Father, you know, if, if you have a lot of unforgiven sin in your life, in your past, is that something that prevents you? Or Because in my mind, it's, it's like a wall that's between me and God. You know, he can't see me. I need to go and make sure that I make sure that I you know, confess, repent, ask Jesus for forgiveness for every one of these things and clear it, bring down that wall that helps me do that. Or is it just move forward? So my so the question so if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking about if unforgiven sins are a block to this relationship. Am I on the right hunt there? Okay. So my first question for you would be unforgiven by who? By Jesus. Okay. By by God. By God. Okay. Okay. Because it could be unforgiven by you. You're not forgiving yourself. Could be one of them. Okay. But because we're, we're talking about where does the forgiveness come from. So I would say if you go ahead and open, if we leave the notes for a second and we open up to anybody, any guesses where I'm going? Anybody? We're talking about how to get forgiveness. Oh yeah, we're going to Ezekiel. Okay, so Ezekiel 18. Okay, and you tell me if this doesn't sound like we're talking about forgiveness. But uh, verse 21, Ezekiel 18, verse 21. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Verse 22 is the key verse. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. So let me ask you this. If God doesn't even remember your transgression of the law, is that not the definition of perfect forgiveness? It's not even a thought anymore. So part of that is not... Part of that is, is not, uh, it's, you're turning away, so that, but you're not actually having to go back. It, it's not a requirement that you ask for forgiveness from Yeshua for this to happen. What I'm saying is that, just like we were talking before, one thing at a time, right? So we repent. Everything we do is, every time we try to keep a commandment that we weren't keeping before, that was sin, not keeping the commandment. And now the effort on that one, we go into this process of learning with him, right? And with the chastening and so on and so forth. And then that is repenting of that one area and getting on board and, and, and then going from there. And so all we can do, I'm a, so you guys, so most of you know I'm a fighter pilot. And so probably most of you think that I can multitask and I can assure you that's a lie. I don't multitask. Um, I do things in sequence way faster than you guys do when I'm operating in my little container that, that you guys don't know how to use. So, the, uh, so when I'm in my, in my area of expertise, my scan, my decision making is just happening really fast, but I can still only make one decision at a time. And so that's still to me the model. And so you can only, you can only do one at a time um, and you just start knocking them out, right? And again, it's the ones that are on your heart. Larry, go ahead. Thank you. 
Amen. Awkwardly, awkwardly spelled Eric, go ahead. <laughs> Revisioning the idea of repent, um, the way you're talking about it sounds like you're using the word as if it were a single act. <clears throat> like, I need to repent of a single act. I, want, I need to single act on a single act. Repent, <laughs> repentance, repentance in the Hebrew mindset is not a single action on a single issue. It is a it is a way of walking because repentance moving forward is shoe is literally in Hebrew to turn. And so you turn away from what it was that made you do what you had done. You're turning towards the father's face. So the act of repentance is to just keep looking at the father because the father is not sin. You will not sin if you're looking at him. It cannot be in his presence. So if you're facing him, you're leaving all of what you had done behind. It's not revisited. You don't go back to your to your vomit. So, shuv, repent, is not a singular action. It is your walk. Amen. Good word. Good word. Good word. The other side of the coin to follow up with that. If you're holding something against yourself, I'm an alcoholic, I'm unforgiving. You're listening to the world and not listening to the Father. Because if the world around us wants to define us by our worst moments, you're you're a failure, you're a quitter, you are this thing, and we all grow up in the world thinking that that one worst moment becomes our identity. Stop listening to it. It's here. Not with the world around us, though. And, I, and on the on flip side of that, I would say Christianity teaches us it's free, right? So it's just all you do is say the prayer, and you've been forgiven for everything. And I would, I would vehemently disagree. It's an action. There's work involved. Um, and you're not going to learn. You're, you're, not, you're not going to learn unless you do. And so you've got to actively act on this correction of, I'm turning back to God, and I'm starting to act differently. Um, you know, because how many, how many Christians have you met that, that said the prayer, and nothing in their life changed? Right? And that's unfortunate, but it's what it is. By turning to him. Because you accepted the, the blood sacrifice and you were baptized down to water. And I've heard of people before who they had remarkable things happen when they were baptized. You know, all of a sudden this whatever it was went away. Now both and on any of the steps it seems to you know seem to have happened. So when you look at that, these things that may have been horrible things to you, when you when you deploy the power there. That's a huge difference. Because we're not really, because I've never heard any in the Christian churches talk about that that way. I've always heard, well, you know, if, it, if the alcohol gets you, or the drugs get you, or the women get you, or the whatever gets you, you know, then you need to just stay away from that, right? Which is not altogether a bad idea if you still cannot uh, impose that power on you. Break the chain. 
Okay, so to sum up, what is, oh, sorry, go ahead, sir. Uh, real quick, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you say repent, I'm hearing confession. Yes. Uh, repent means to turn from sin. Yes. But when you say to repent, I'm hearing Or have you learned from it and been instructed, rebuked, corrected by, by him, and you don't do that anymore, and you know that it's because him that you don't do that, then you've turned from that, and there is no guilt, there is no shame, there is no weight of the enemy holding you back, because that's all the, that's all guilt and shame are. Amen. Okay, so to sum up this relationship between us and the Father, what is the key attribute of your personality that you are required to incorporate into yourself in order to successfully stay in the relationship? I see that we have some friend or some fans of Sanctified Supply Company, and this to me is their best work right here. Stay humble, stay kind. Uh, it sums it up. And what is the antithesis that we have to look to avoid? Pride. pride. And every single place, doing a deep dive in pride, again, lots of pages of compiled scriptures, there is not one single place where pride is described the way the world would have us believe that it's good. It is described as nothing but bad and evil in the Word of God. So pride is the problem. It severs this relationship between us and the Father. Humility is what keeps us in the relationship in order to give us the heart to accept the correction and act on it. Cool? All right, moving on. The next, how are we doing? Does anybody need, we've gone an hour. Let's maybe take five for a restroom break. Um, so let's try, so we're on the hour now. Let's take, let's take 10, because depending on how many people need it, let's go at 10 after, let's reconvene and we'll get into the second great commandment.